Well, good morning. My name is Michael Spurl. I am a uh, PGY3 or third year resident in the Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation Residency Program here at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Uh, I want to thank the Charter House Lecture Series for having me to come record this presentation and, and talk about something I'm fairly passionate about and also talk to you about some things you can apply to your life as well. So with that in mind, uh, I'm going to be doing my presentation today on traumatic brain injury and fall prevention. Our goals for today are to review the definition and causes of traumatic brain injury. Together we'll evaluate new frontiers for traumatic brain injury research and treatment. And we'll discuss together specific fall prevention strategies in the older population. So what is a traumatic brain injury? It's described as a disruption in the normal brain function that can be caused by a bump, blow, or jolt to the head or otherwise from a penetrating head injury. Think of concussions as being a mild form of these traumatic brain injuries and car accidents where you hit your head and lose consciousness for a long period of time as something being a more severe form. So these different levels of severity can be classified as either, as either mild or moderate to severe. A mild traumatic brain injury often happens with a brief change in mental status or loss of consciousness uh, and is also more commonly known as a concussion. Moderate to severe traumatic brain injury is an extended period of unconsciousness or changes in, in thinking skills or memory loss after the injury. And this tends to have more persistent symptoms. We'll talk a little bit more later about what these symptoms include and, and what to look out for in each case. So why is this discussion of traumatic brain injury important? We know that approximately two and a half million Americans present to the emergency department every year with a traumatic brain injury. About uh, 800,000 of those are children, oftentimes with more mild symptoms, such as a concussion from sports or a fall off of a bike. But that means that um, still two thirds of these are in adults and, and prominently in the older population. We know that 70 to 90% of traumatic brain injuries are fall into that mild concussion category but that still leaves uh, hundreds of thousands of patients every year that end up requiring hospitalization as a result of a more severe injury to their brain. We know that traumatic brain injury can cause cognitive or thinking changes, behavioral changes, and physical changes as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about what each of those might be in just a minute. So what are the causes of traumatic brain injury? The number one most important cause and most common cause in across all age groups is still falls. It tends to affect both the very young and the older as the more um, prominent groups. So children think under three years old falling and hitting their head or being dropped by their uh, mother or having some sort of accident where they hit their head. In older adult, adults over the age of 65, falls account for 81% of emergency department visits due to traumatic brain injury. The second most common cause is being struck by or an against an object. Think getting hit in the head with something or in sports having your head struck um, uh, as, as a younger adult. Um, third most common is motor vehicle accidents. And this actually used to be the most common, but interventions in prevention of car accidents and limiting the severity of car accidents through safety measures have, have decreased those now down to the third most common cause. And the fourth most common cause is due to assault, whether that's from being struck in the head by, some, by, by another person or a gunshot wound, um, which would classify as a penetrating traumatic brain injury. So what are some of the symptoms of TBI? What is there to look out for? This is a table from the CDC that, that points out some of the common symptoms in traumatic brain injury. And more, more of these symptoms are, are focused around the mild traumatic brain injury category. So these symptoms can be divided into four different categories. Your thinking skills or your remembering skills. So oftentimes people will have difficulty thinking clearly, feeling slowed down or in a fog. They'll have difficulty concentrating and remembering new information and, and repeating something to you later on especially. Um, physical manifestations of a traumatic brain injury are headaches, changes in vision, 
nausea or vomiting, especially early on after the brain injury, dizziness and balance changes, difficulty with bright lights or loud noises, and fatigue and feelings of having no energy are very common. Now both of these um, categories of symptoms are probably the ones you think of when you think of a concussion. But just as importantly are the changes to patients' mood and emotions. So oftentimes people will be irritable, will act out, which is, not, which is out of their normal character. They'll have excessive sadness or anxiety that um, they typically don't have. It also can affect patients' sleep and can be something that causes patients more to sleep extra or sleep less. And it can also cause some difficulty with falling asleep. And we call these changes in the sleep-wake cycle as a result of injury to those parts of the brain. In severe traumatic brain injury, there are a few things to look out for and some things you should think of when, um, when you have an event that may, may cause some brain injury if you strike your head. So these are those red flag signs that should have you go to the emergency department right away. If you have a headache that gets worse or does not go away, um, especially in the setting of not previously having any headaches, if you have any new weakness, numbness, or decreased coordination in your arms or legs, if you're having vomiting or nausea that uh, persists and doesn't go away after one time or having a short period of nausea, that's something you should go in for. If you have slurred speech or are very drowsy and can't be woken up by friends or family, if you, anyone notices that you're shaking or having convulsions or if they tell you that they've noticed you've had a seizure, if you notice that there, you can't recognize people or places or you're confused, restless, or feel agitated for no reason after hitting your head. And then, especially if you lose consciousness after a fall, hitting your head, or having some other thing hit you in the head, that's something that you should go in and be checked out for, especially in your older age. So when you go into the emergency department to be checked out, what, what can you expect? What will the doctors be looking for? So the first thing that the, the doctors in the emergency room will want to do is look for serious signs, so signs of that severe traumatic brain injury. And al along with a clinical examination and discussing what happened with you and hearing about your symptoms, they'll do some imaging of your brain. This can include either a, a CT scan or a CAT scan of your head, and that's normally the first line thing to do to, to rule out a severe traumatic brain injury. And, or they can do a brain MRI as well to look for more subtle signs if they're concerned, even if a CT scan doesn't show any changes. So here are a few, um, a few things, a few different conditions or types of damage to the brain tissue that doctors will look out for. The bottom left picture is a subdural hematoma or blood products that accumulate outside of the brain and put pressure onto the brain. This can cause damage to the brain stem itself, which can be life-threatening. So something that wants to be uh, taken care of right away. In the middle picture, this is an example of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is a more subtle um, finding on imaging, but shows you can see on the, on the left side of the brain that there are some areas that are a little bit brighter than the rest. And that's some blood products that are accumulated within the actual tissue of the brain. And this third picture is one that's much more subtle and requires a brain MRI to, to rule out. But this is called diffuse axonal injury, which essentially means that there's damage to the actual nerve fibers in the brain from stretching or shearing forces, oftentimes um, after hitting your head or being in a high impact collision especially. And this can cause damage to the brain that doesn't necessarily cause bleeding but needs to be taken care of nonetheless. So what does recovery look like? Well, there are a lot of factors that, that play into what someone's recovery from a traumatic brain injury will look like. First and foremost is what the severity of the brain injury is, and that's why being checked out by your doctor and having that classified for you, having discussions about what recovery may look like for you and symptoms you might uh, encounter is very important. Your age and previous health, though, also play into what your recovery looks like. So if you were to have a mild concussion or a mild traumatic brain injury, also known as a concussion, one of the most important things you can do is rest your brain. The brain is a, 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 an organ that, that tends to heal on its own and, and remake pathways if there's any injury to them. So rest is the most important and limiting 
uh, flare-ups of symptoms are, is incredibly important. So with that in mind, you avoid activities that seem to make your symptoms worse. For some people that can be bright lights, for some people that can be reading or focusing on electronic screens, those sorts of things can sometimes make people, people's symptoms worse in the early recovery period. And so it's best to just avoid those. Slowly reintroducing exercise to the point where it doesn't make your symptoms much worse, like causing very bad headaches, can be uh, very important in your recovery, as well as preventing further injury. Repeat injury is the one thing that causes long-term symptoms to be the most prominent. So you want to avoid hitting your head again at, at any cost. And the most important thing to think of is to listen to your body and talk with your doctor if you are experiencing symptoms of a concussion and you are working through your recovery. In moderate to severe traumatic brain injury, there's often more complicated um, symptom management that is required, as these patients tend to have longer lasting symptoms. We know that it's a serious problem and life expectancy can be reduced by three to eight years when compared to those without traumatic brain injury. And that doesn't include the patients who have had their brain injury actually cost them their life in the early period. The most important thing in recovery from a severe traumatic brain injury is again time, resting your brain and allowing it to have its inherent ability to heal itself. And managing the symptoms that come up on a person-to-person -person basis by your physician team can help you get through that um, early time period and make the most recovery possible in the first year when we know that the brain is at its most elastic and, and able to rebuild. So I wanted to talk a little bit about symptom management and what we do to treat patients with traumatic brain injury. I won't go into too much depth as I, each one of these topics could be a whole lecture in itself but I wanted to touch on some of the new treatment options and some considerations that you may hear about either in friends or family or um, in athletes, for instance, if you're a sports fan, that they need to get through if they have a more severe traumatic brain injury. So in the acute care of traumatic brain injury, so after someone goes into the emergency department and it's found that they have a severe traumatic brain injury, the most important thing that the doctors in the hospital will do is manage and minimize the risk of secondary brain injury. This means injury as a result of the chemical and uh, physical aspects of the brain at the time of the injury as opposed to uh, managing the actual first line. This includes monitoring of intracranial pressure, which is a long word just to mean that um, trying to reduce swelling in the brain so that it doesn't cause too much pressure on the brain stem and cause any further issues. If there is bleeding in the brain, like we saw in some of that imaging, it may be um, indicated for, for the physicians to um, surgically or procedurally limit damage from the bleeding. So whether that's the neurosurgeons opening up space to allow blood to not cause pressure onto the brain tissue, or it's an interventional radiologist going in up through the vessels and clotting off any ongoing bleeding. And during this time, oftentimes patients will require care in the intensive care unit or by a specialized neurology team to make sure that they're monitoring for the most common symptoms right after a traumatic brain injury. One of those most common symptoms that they'll be keeping a close eye on is seizures. It can happen uh, and happens often within the first seven days after a traumatic brain injury but it can be something that develops into a chronic problem for patients who have brain injuries. Four to seven percent of patients who get admitted to the hospital for a severe traumatic brain injury will have some sort of lifelong seizure disorder. These seizures are diagnosed either clinically by seeing the patient in a seizure episode or with an electro, uh, electrographic uh, monitoring of their brain or an EEG. And this can show the brain waves itself and tell us if there are seizures that isn't necessarily causing big shaking symptoms within a patient. And there are lots of choices of anti-seizure drugs that the neurologist will, will help with managing for these patients. An important symptom of traumatic brain injury that we talk about in, in their post-acute care, so oftentimes after they leave the intensive care unit and as they're starting to wake up more, they're getting more interactive with the environment around them, is agitation or changes in their behavior. 
Despite how complicated traumatic brain injury can be in, as far as someone's medical history, one of the most distressing things to their caregivers or family or friends is their changes in their behavior. They sometimes are just not the same person that they were before as a result of the damage to their brain. Depending on the area of the brain that's injured, this can present in very different ways, but a common symptom is agitation, where patients are inappropriate in the things that they say, in the activities that they do, where they don't have good um, insight into, into the activities that they're doing and why they might be unsafe for them. And it can change just about every part of a patient's personality, which, like you would imagine, is, is, can be very distressing, especially early on after a brain injury. And so this is treated on a patient-by-patient -patient basis, depending on what their symptoms may be. We try to avoid medications as much as possible and allow the brain to heal on its own before starting any medications, but sometimes it requires medications to make sure the patients aren't being unsafe in the hospital. And one of the major things we can do is support caregivers in this time, because it, like I said, it's very distressing and it, and it is a big change for many people. Headaches are the most common physical complaint after a traumatic brain injury, whether mild or severe. Uh, it can present in many, as many different forms, and many of you may have some sort, sort of headache issue that you've been dealing with over the years. There are migraines, there are tension headaches, there are cluster headaches or, or muscle um, tightness headaches. These can all be a part of the recovery after a traumatic brain injury. And so the medication management will really depend on the type of headache that the patient uh, is, is undergoing. And sometimes it can lead to long-term headaches over the rest of the patient's life. And then the traumatic brain injury, depending on the area of the brain that's injured, can cause difficulties with speech, swallowing, thinking skills, and loss of strength or sensation. The best way to help um, patients recover from these sorts of symptoms is not through medications most of the time, but it's through modification of their activity and practice. We know that early on after a traumatic brain injury, the first few months are the most uh, high yield in bringing patients uh, strength, sensation, thinking skills, swallowing skills um, back under their control and letting them be independent. And so we do that with speech therapists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and dysphagia therapists. And each one of them have their own specialized area that they work on um, care with their patients. With that in mind, oftentimes patients with traumatic brain injury come to the acute inpatient rehabilitation unit. So this is the unit um, newly built in, the, in uh, St. Mary's Hospital in the fourth and fifth levels of the Generos building, so the new addition on top of Generos. And these patients are ones who are medically stable for the most part. They still have some ongoing issues that need medical care, but they have gotten out of the weeds of the early recovery from their traumatic brain injury. This is an intensive therapy program, so they receive three hours of those therapies I talked about on the last slide every day. They have nursing cares um, and often require specific cares from their nurses. And then they have a doctor, a physiatrist, which is the type of doctor I'm training to be, managing their medical needs. These patients are the ones I feel I'm passionate about and the ones I want to um, dedicate my career to. So working with patients with brain injury after, um, uh, after an event like this and getting them rehabilitated so that they can get home as safely, as quickly, and as independently as possible. While they're on the rehab unit, they additionally get supportive services from recreational therapists, social workers, care coordinators, and case managers, and other, many other support staff that I uh, wouldn't have the space to list here. But we have a huge team that's all very important. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about research um, and new frontiers for research uh, in traumatic brain injury. There are many studies going on throughout the nation, but I wanted to focus on just some things that we do here at Mayo, specifically focused on traumatic brain injury, and then how technology and, and traumatic brain injury, injury are interacting. So at Mayo, there are some current studies in early stages that are focusing on more accurately classifying the severity of traumatic brain injury. 
right now the classification system is is fairly vague and leaves some things up to subjective um, means so what the physicians think at the time we're working on a study that um, is hoping to ad use advanced and specialized imaging techniques such as magnetic resonance elastography or MRE to determine the severity of the injury and help with prognosis for the future even early on. Mayo is also a traumatic brain injury model system which is a group of hospitals and uh, throughout the, the United States that focuses on understanding the epidemiology or the reasons and the statistics behind traumatic brain injury, as well as analyzing recovery and outcomes both in your own institution and elsewhere. There are many studies underway um, as part of this TBI model system. Um, and then there's some exciting new frontiers for research as well. So as as technology becomes more and more integrated with medicine, there have been thoughts of using virtual reality systems to help with training patients after their traumatic brain injury. So as an adjunct to those different therapists, this would be something that the therapist can integrate to utilize um, training in, in thinking skills, in their balance, in their strength, as well as helping them with emotional changes afterwards. So these are simulated environments that patients can interact with and there's a, a host of different types of ways that patients can do this and many different styles of virtual reality systems. But there are just a couple of pictures down below of some examples and it's a simulated environment that you can interact with and the parameters can be set. It's a very controlled environment and it can be done safely under the direction of a physical therapist or occupational therapist. So I've talked a lot about traumatic brain injury and what we do after a traumatic brain injury. But one of the most important things that medicine has done in recent years is worked on prevention of this condition. I'm sure you've heard in the news there's lots of high profile research about traumatic brain injuries in athletes and chronic traumatic encephalopathy which is something that's a long term um, Sequela, if you have too many traumatic brain injuries, even if they're mild, each individual one is mild. If you have too many, it's something that can last for a longer period of time. So there have been changes over the years as a result of this research in limiting traumatic brain injuries. There have been awareness campaigns about this. There's some big blockbuster movies that are out there. There have been rule changes in football and hockey and many of the contact sports. And there's very strict concussion protocols for athletes to be able to return back to play. So all of these things have limited the amount, especially in young children, of, of concussions and traumatic brain injuries that they, that they undergo and also ensuring that they have adequate recovery before they go back to their sport. As I said earlier, motor vehicles now are just the third leading cause of traumatic brain injury. And that's been as a result of speed limits, increased laws, car safety, um, things such as seat belts and, and changing technology to limit the impact to the driver. And all of these things have reduced the number of traumatic brain injuries that people sustain as a result of motor vehicle accidents. But why is prevention important for you? Well, like I said at the beginning, falls are the most, um, the highest cause of traumatic brain injuries in older adults over the age of 65 and accounts for 81% of them presenting to the emergency department. The good news is, is that falls can be prevented. And it's not something that you have to be fearful of, but you can prevent and feel confident in your ability to avoid falls. And so that's what I'm going to talk about a little more next. How can this apply to you? So to outline the problem, falls are costly and not just for their traumatic brain injury risk. One in five falls in the older population leads to some sort of injury, whether that's a broken bone or a strike to the head or even some more complicated things. It leads to 3 million emergency department visits in older people per year, and the costs are greater than 50 billion in the United States in just 2015 alone. And like I said, fear of falling often can lead to decreased participation in your activities and therefore decreased enjoyment in life. And it becomes a vicious cycle. The more afraid of falling that you are, the less strong and, and less good your balance is, and therefore you are actually at increased risk of falling. So let's talk about how we can do that. There are many risk factors that have been identified for falls. 
lower body weakness, difficulty with balance or walking. Some medications can cause you increased risk of fall. Vision problems that aren't adequately adjusted with corrective lenses. Difficulties with your foot footwear or foot pain. And home hazards, including uneven surfaces or loose rugs can be tripping hazards and lead to falls. Each one of these things can increase your risk of falls, but a combination of any or all of them leads to the highest risk. And so minimizing your risk on a person by person basis is our goal for you. So what can you do? The first thing you can do is talk to your doctor about your risk factors. How can you change the things that were on the last slide and how can you make your life as enjoyable and as active as possible, but also limiting your risk? You can review your medications together, talk about medications that maybe you were on when you were younger and you might not need as you age, and reevaluate medications that might increase your falls risk. And these are included under the BEERS criteria. So that's something that you might be able to mention to your physician. And importantly, you can make a fall prevention plan that's specific to you. One of those things that is specific to you is some strength and balance exercise that you can incorporate into your daily routine. Your physician can decide if physical therapy is appropriate for you to get a home exercise program that you can do on a daily basis. But even if physical therapy isn't the appropriate step right now, you can include activities such as Tai Chi, yoga or Pilates, even things that are low impact and very easy for you to do and anyone can do are important and a few minutes per day can significantly decrease your risk of falls. Some examples of exercises are just sitting up from a chair with um, balance repeatedly until you feel your legs getting uh, sore or like they're getting a workout. You can do marching in place, you can raise your legs out to the sides or to the back. You can balance on one leg with um, supports on either side of you to work on your balance uh, uh, training or you can stand with one foot in front of the other with a heel to the, your toe. And just like walking a straight line, this works on your balance, but is less risk of tripping during the activity. There are many, many other choices. And physical therapists, athletic trainers, personal trainers, any of these people could help you get a regimen uh, that works for you with your body and your level of functioning right now. Another thing you can do is check your eyesight and corrective lenses. Make sure your glasses are up to their most recent prescription, at least once per year. And if you have bifocals or progressive lenses, think about having just a distance prescription lens that you use for when you go outside to exercise. Good footwear that's supportive for you and fits well is, is important as well. Loose sandals or slippers can be more likely to cause tripping accidentally, even in and around your, your apartment or your home. And supportive footwear gives your body feedback about the surfaces you're walking on. If things are un uneven, the shoes will transmit that to your foot so you can sense that better. And then using appropriate assistive devices such as walkers or canes. The most important thing that I'd like you to take away from this slide is that not one, it is not a one-size-fits-all. There are many different styles of walkers and canes and I just chose a few of them to demonstrate on this slide but there are hundreds and hundreds of different styles of each. In general, when talking about walkers, the more wheels you have, the less support you have, and the more likely it is the, for the walker to slide out in front of you or get behind you and cause you to fall. So consider meeting with a physical therapist to discuss the right walking aid for you. Each person's walking is different and, and using good technique is as important as, as having a, a walking aid itself. And then you can make your home or apartment safer. You can remove things that could be tripped over, such as cords on the floor, loose throw rugs that can slide around or you can catch your toe on. And you can rearrange furniture within the room to make sure that even in low light conditions, as it, if you were to get up and go to the bathroom or those sorts of things, you wouldn't trip over furniture or catch your leg on a coffee table, those sorts of things. You can add grab bars in your uh, room or apartment to, for more support in areas that where you feel like, man, I very, very commonly get off balance in this situation. So whether that's getting into the bathroom, whether that's getting up from your recliner, those sorts of things, um, you can add grab bars to give yourself support. 
and then adding nice bright lighting, especially in, in low light conditions, such as the middle of the night scenario going to the bathroom. If there's more light, you're less likely to not see an obstacle and trip over it. Other things you can think about that don't necessarily have to do with falls but are important for you as well in traumatic brain injury prevention is wearing a seatbelt at all times in the car. Every single time, buckle up. If you are um, active biking or rollerblading or these sorts of activities, if you stay active in those ways, make sure to wear a helmet. Helmets aren't just for, for young kids. If you drink alcohol, make sure to do, the, do so only in moderation because um, having too much alcohol can reduce your coordination, your balance, and reflexes and lead to an increased risk of falls and traumatic brain injury. And most importantly, ask, from, ask for help from friends or family if you need it. Make sure not to stretch yourself over what you can do. The staff here, I'm sure, is always help, happy to help with things. So feel free to reach out if you need help. So with that, I'll finish. These are some of the references that I mentioned in, throughout my slides. But I'd love to hear questions from all of you. I put, put my email down there at the bottom, and feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions that come up after watching. I was really looking forward to being able to meet with you all in person and hear your questions and, and go through things. So I'd love to hear from you um, if you'd like to reach out. Thanks again to the Charter House Lecture Series for having me, and thanks uh, for listening. Um, thank you very much.